It's incredible. I mean, I, you know, I've been following you for a long time now and uh, your music and you, you're just like, man, <laughs> talk about, talk about busy. And I mean, that's like, you know. Well, you know, I was just talking to someone, you know, because I've always been like divided between being a band leader, yeah. a professional trumpet player and an arranger. So between those three things, and I've always believed, like, I'm way more into being a like a, a freelance musician than a starving artist. I'm not really into the whole starving. I know some people love the starving artist concept. That's not my my thing at all. You know, <laughs> I, I, I like I like to go to work, sure. doing music and get paid. That's what I really love. So as long as it's good music, I mean, I don't really play. You know, I'm lucky enough that I only get. But you know, it's just kind of like that's what I do. So when people say, "Can you do it?" I go, "Yeah, I'll do it." Yeah. I mean, but you do, you know, at the best possible yeah, level no, from, with, with the, the best guys, music. you know. And yeah, that's... Great, but like, it doesn't matter what kind of music it is to yeah, me. It's like, true. as long as it's great. Yeah. Like, I don't really differentiate, like, to honestly, between being like an uh, improvising creative musician and playing horns for somebody, because to me, it's like, all music. I'm always improvising in a way because my life is improvisation, you know? True. Like, like the music itself might not be improvisation, but the life's improvisation. So, and I got a horn in my hand, so I'm improvising something. I'm improvising yeah. lifestyle, that's for sure. <laughs> yeah, I think all, all of your groups speak of that, you know, throughout your career. When I look yeah. at just what you said now, you know, it's like all this mix of everything that's in the end, it's music, you know. You know in the end, it's exactly, in the end, it's music. And, yeah. and that's what, you know, and the thing is, what I found is that the more things I get called to do, the more I learn about music and the more like I bring that into my music, you know, that yeah. just makes my music richer, you know, yeah. so, you know, yeah. I take it all as an opportunity, not just, not just to get paid. I don't want to seem like I'm just a mercenary because I'm always learning and stealing, you know, I'm a big thief. I'm like one of the all time. And when, when I play with people sometimes they, and they, they give me something, I said, you know, I'm going to steal this, right? You know who I am. I'm going to steal this. I mean, it's, not gonna sound, it's not going to sound like that. But I'm stealing this just so you know who you're dealing with. And everyone just goes, no, it's cool, man. We know that about you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. No, but, you know, it, I want to ask you, I want to start this talk with, uh, with Manifesto of Henryisms, which is wow. like, you know, again, talking about bringing, yeah. it, bringing it all together. And, uh, you know, first I want to ask you about the, the musicians, you know, in the group. It's like the Hot Nine and... You know, some names keep repeating. You've created an amazing community like Curtis and, you know, Doc Wieselman, Peter Applebaum, and I guess, you know, from other bands like Kenny and Tony Cher and Brigham Krause and the list goes on. But like, uh, you've created this sort of sense of family and community, if I'm right. Like, what does this bring to your music? Well, that's why I call it community music, because, you know, the thing is, it's trust. Yeah. You know, it's, it's all about trust. Like, they trust me. And I trust them. So, you know, I know that I can bring music and they're going to bring their personalities into it. And they trust me to say, hey, if Steven says show up and at this time and do this, I don't have to worry because yep. we just show up and play and it's going to be taken care of. And we trust each other. And, you know, I don't, I'm sure you know about me. I don't do a lot of rehearsing and I just tr I'm a big believer in the moment. Mm -hmm. That's what I think makes my record sound kind of unique is that a lot of my records are actually people playing music for the first time. And what you get when you have a, a, a people who play as a community and trust each other, there's something magic that happens the first time they play the music because they don't know it yet. They don't have a pre, they're not going in there with an agenda. Like yeah. I'll do this and this and this, it's going to work. They're going like, wow, what's going to happen? Whoa, I made it to the end. <laughs> but meanwhile, they're all reacting in real time to each other. 
And I think it gives, I think if anything, that's what gives a continuity to my like 25, 30 years of records is not stylistically or even, um, you know, it, like um, orchestrationally, mm -hmm. what it is. Like I was just talking to my friend Ralph Alessi. I don't oh, know, sure. you know, Ralph. Oh, yeah, sure. I know him. He's one of yeah. my favorites. Yeah. I know him. He's yeah. one of my favorites. Yeah. yeah, yeah, me too. And and we're, we're from the same part of the world. You know, he was, a, you know, when I grew up, I, I, he was a legend because his father, he's from two generations of trumpeters. His father and his grandfather. I didn't know that. Yeah, his okay. grandfather. His grandfather taught Donald Byrd. No, seriously? Yeah. I, oh, wow, yeah. man, I have to ask Ralph about that one day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, wow. Um, and we were talking about, I was telling him how much I loved his ECM records, oh. and I told him, like, yeah. you know, how uh, I've never done anything like that, you know, with the, that kind of group and playing just the regular trumpet with the valves. and Because most of my small band stuff, people know me from the sex model. And he said, well, what yeah. about Spanish Fly? I said, yeah, but I said, your records are like piano, bass, and drums with a trumpet and even if you're being creative about how you write there's still a certain hierarchy the way the sound comes out your trumpet's up here yeah and then you have your piano and then you have the drums kind of in the middle and the bass down here and even if they're doing other stuff it's they can't help themselves but create something of that classic sound while Spanish Fly was a trumpet, a tuba, and a slide guitar. Yeah, I like, love that band, man. Yeah. You can't really, that, we, nobody, there was no hierarchy and there was no preconceived um, role of each instrument. And I was saying, you know, that's actually something I would like to do. I've never done a record where I just play the trumpet, there's a bass player and a drummer, and that's actually what kind of next thing I want to try doing. In oh, really? Oh, man. Like a small, small, smaller brand? Not sex mob because I mean, like a smaller flying. band. No, what? but just playing the regular trumpet with the valves. Yeah, not but like a quart quartet. I mean, like something yeah, a quartet like that. Or a trio. Like I don't oh, yeah. know. If I'll, I might just do a trio. Just, and I don't even know if I would release it. I just want to record it and and see what that would be because I have all this music for that and I've just never done it. You know, oh, man, yeah. And um, I don't know how we got to that, but we we're talking about you know trust oh, yeah. the community. And just, you know, yeah, there's these guys that, 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 um, and I do a lot of, you know, I'm always doing new projects. It's something no one even knows about, which is because it's only been done twice in New York, which is MTO plays James Brown. Seriously. Oh, yeah, man. Did, it's incredible. It's incredible. With Vernon Reed on, on, on guitar. There's two oh, guitars. fuck. Really? And, and Medeski. And um, the singers were um, oh. Corey Glover. Eric Mingus, Cat Russell, and Nicole Atkins. And, you know, but it was interesting because I used a slightly different band. Doug wasn't around, so Brigham played baritone. Oh, wow. And, oh, and Eric, the baritone player, moved over to alto because I thought that would work good with James Brown. So, you know, even within Ooh. the community, you know, we can, like, switch roles, you know, and kind of bring people from each community into – there's a lot of intersections, what I'm trying to say. With this yeah, group. I see that, yeah. yeah you know, with all, with all these groups and, um, you know, and I don't know if you know this, but I've been playing with Peter since I was like uh, 11 or 12 years old. You, you, I've read that you guys actually grew up together, right? Yeah. Yeah. I was in his band. Oh, I joined man. his band the summer after sixth grade. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Wow. So yeah. you, you guys basically started researching, I mean, like, you know, jazz together. Well, like he, yeah. Well, the thing is that Peter was a prodigy. So he could play like, when he was a kid, he could play saxophone, drums, and piano, but like a grown-up. Like he didn't sound like a kid. I sounded like a kid. I was enthusiastic, but uh, I sounded like a kid. He actually sounded like a grown-up when he was a kid. So he was like, and he was the guy that said, oh, you need to check out, first he said, you need to check out Freddie Hubbard and Horace Silver. And then he said, okay, now you need to check out the art ensemble and Cecil Taylor. And that was, you know, seventh or eighth grade. We were wow, listening to that man. kind of music. Rossan, Roland Kirk. We yeah. used to go to Keystone Corner and see Rossan. Saw, uh, I think I saw Sam Rivers in either seventh or eighth grade. I definitely wow. saw Rossan. I can't remember which grade. Uh, and same with Rossan, seventh or eighth grade. Probably, probably maybe tenth grade for the art ensemble. But you know, wow. when I was a kid, that was 
it was also the music that was in the Bay Area at that time. I try to explain yeah. that to people. Like, it, it, people say they use the word avant-garde, and it wasn't, I don't think we thought of it as avant-garde. We just thought of it as like, well, if you go to a club, this is who you're going to hear. And it, this is a way. And if we went to hear older musicians, like if we went to hear um, Art Blakey or Dexter Gordon, they played in an older style because they were older. Sure. But if you heard, makes sense, yeah. Right? But if you heard Cecil, the art ensemble, who were younger, they played in a younger style. It didn't seem avant garde. It just seemed like, well, these guys play that way and these older guys play that way. And it's, you know, it's just this music. Yeah. So I think it really helped at a young age to be exposed to that, but also not to have a preconceived notion of like, oh, this, this is, is difficult. This is difficult, or this is this, this is this. It was just music, you know. Yeah. That that explains now a lot, actually. <laughs> you yeah. know, about you, about your music. I mean, you know, yeah. like I actually mean, you know who Howard Johnson was, right? The oh, great sure. Two- of, of course. So he was yeah. he was a good friend and he was also a big influence when I was a when I was a kid and then a friend when I got later, because I'd see his name and his name would be like on a Pharaoh Sanders record. Yeah, and his name would be like on a Carly Simon record. And his name would be on a Mingus record. And, a, and then his name would be on the band record. And his name would be on an Archie Shep record. And his band would be, name would be on a John Lennon record or Saturday Night Live. And I was like, yeah, that that's kind of what I want to do. I want to play with everyone good. And one time, Howard and I were comparing like funny stories. And I said, well, Howard, one time I did three days with Sonny Simmons. And then I went to go play with Linda Ronstadt. And he said, you win. <laughs> oh, man, that's, a, yeah, that's talk about, I mean, both are good. Yeah, they're like, both, it's they're really right. like, yeah. They're, they're, they're different worlds, but what am I doing? I'm getting up there and playing the trumpet. I'm doing the same thing, you know. Yeah. I'm just playing the music that fits for each person. I'm tr- trying to play the music, you know, trying to play the music that fits for each person, you know, hopefully playing music that fits for each person. Yeah, definitely. Wow, yeah. Like, I mean, but with Peter, did did you guys then move to New York together or? No, what happened was I moved, he moved for one year, went out of high school and it didn't really work out. He went back to California and and got the hieroglyphic ensemble. Those records, the hieroglyphics records. Yeah, sure. And I'm I'm a year younger. Then, Then I moved to New York to go to school, to go to Columbia. And, mm, okay. um, and what I did was I went there for a year and a half, or, no, two years, I guess. And, um, then dropped out because I was, you know, I was always trying to play gigs and it wasn't really like, it was getting a little crazy trying to go to school and play sure. gigs. And then Peter was living in the Bay area with the hieroglyphics and playing with Don Cherry and doing all that in the Bay area. And he, he, so he, he showed up again, I don't know. I mean, it's hard for me to remember. I mean, I moved in sure. 79. And he Already? Moved. Well, yeah, I was, I was just 17 years old. Wow. And you know, I was almost 18, you know, almost 18. And Peter probably moved 10, 15 years later. Okay, only. Ah, I thought, I thought you guys came together, kind of. Okay. No, no, no. I was already kind of like, like he missed that Working. whole, like, original. I was part of the whole original Zorn. Yeah. Rain Horvitz. Um, those guys were really young when I met them. I mean, I was when I met those guys, I was 19 and they were like 26. And I thought they were old because I was still living at the college dorm when I met them. And they yeah. had their own apartments. So I just thought, wow, man, these guys, these guys got together. They had their own apartments. But they went they were only like 26, 27, 25. You know, they're not that much older than me. And yeah, so I met all those guys the summer of 81. Wow. I made a record with Sahib Sarbib, uh, which happened, what happened was Butch Morris. I knew Butch from the Bay Area. Yeah. And I've known Butch since I was, I don't know, 14 years old, something like wow. that. Yeah. And so I'd seen him play with this band, Sahib Sarbib, and I really liked the band. So I, I would call Butch. i say, Butch, you know, man, I love that band you play with, Sahib Sarbib. I, I like that music a lot. He said, well, man, they're making a record. And I haven't been playing my cornet. I've been writing. Back then, it was before conduction. You know, he was writing, yeah. composing a lot. And, and he said, why don't you just go to the record session? So he doesn't tell anyone I'm showing up. So they got a record session. And I just show up like I'm this 19-year-old kid who's living at a college dorm. And everyone, and it was 
Ahmed Abdullah and Roy Campbell in the trumpet section. Ooh, wow. uh, Jamil Moondock, Paul Shapiro, oh. a guy named Booker T, who was really amazing tenor player. I don't know what happened to him. Uh, Dave Sulson, you know, from the Microscopic Septet. Um, you know, just this, <coughs> this whole gang of like these, those musicians. And um, I think we recorded like Thursday, Friday, Saturday, or Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. And Dave Sulson says, oh, on Sunday, he says, man, come hang out. I have a gig Sunday afternoon at this place that you're in. So I go down there, and it's a microscopic septet. And back then, Zorn was the alto player. <laughs> and hanging out was Elliot Sharp, Bobby Previtt, and Wayne Horvitz. So like in five days, I met the entire East Village scene. Yeah. And, you know, I was young, enthusiastic, and play well enough that people were like oh man wow you know you they just welcomed me in like yeah we need a trumpet player like come hang because they weren't really like a lot of trumpet players on the exactly scene yeah who were living down there you know roy lived up roy was there but roy lived up in the in um in the bronx and, and ahmed lived in in brooklyn so it wasn't really you know and you know butch was in the east village there were some some trumpet players in the east village but there wasn't really like a local trumpet player so i kind of yeah. ended up playing with all these guys you know yeah I said, no, I mean, like, uh, you know, I did these talks with Wayne and with Bobby and Elliot, actually. And, you know, they all told me, like, that this New York in the early 80s, it was just blooming with creativity, especially, you know, in the East Village, that it was just like, you know, incredible sessions and all the time playing. And, and, no, and nobody, and it was, and it was really off, like, nobody really knew about it. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, no one wrote about it. Really. Yeah. It was just like, it wasn't part of like the jazz, a little house concert or a, a rock club or a punk rock club or an art gallery or, you know what I'm saying? So yeah. it wasn't really, nobody, if you weren't in that scene, you didn't know about it, basically. It was very underground. But it was a very fertile time where people really had, you were able to get ideas together, you know? Yeah. 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 Yeah, I mean, uh, Elliot told me, you know, there were so many blends of music going on, you know, like mixing everything, like punk with jazz and free impro and whatever you want to call it. I mean, you know, but it was just like this one huge creativity blooming and uh, incredible. Yeah, so we yeah. just trying stuff, like, especially because we, it was, we were all young and we had young friends and we were playing at night. So there was also very punk and funk aspect yeah. of a lot of the music yeah. we were you know it's, it goes back to what i was saying about rhythm you know about like the idea of avant-garde like if you saw art blakey or or when i was a kid if you saw art blakey or dexter gordon they played in that rhythm that they played since they were young that's the exactly. rhythm they played while cecil taylor in the Arnold ensemble played a really different kind of rhythm it was a very free rhythm and a very yeah. flowing okay. rhythm and it had a lot to do with the times. And then we were figuring out our own rhythm. Like, we can, like if we tried to play like Cecil Taylor, that really wouldn't be who we were. Because that was who he was. So yeah. and we were like, well, what do we do? So maybe we mix punk music with it. Maybe we mix funk music with it. Like, let's see what happens when we take these rhythms. And, and that kind of helped, you know, we kind of create this new way of playing music. Yeah. Yeah, yeah definitely. Yeah. Must have been interesting, you know, like, I, I always wish I was like, you know, when people tell me about, let's say, the loft sessions in the 70s, or like right. when you were telling me now, and that you could be like a fly, or that people had like, you know, these recorders back then, know. you know, imagine like, you know, L Liebman telling me like, yeah, there was a session, and there was like Brecker, Lovano, and uh, Steve Grossman, and, oh, yeah. and like, those man, guys, you know, yeah. It's the same right. with you guys, you know. Yeah, so their scene, you know, as they told you, it was a little farther up. They had yeah. these lofts, like in the Flower District on 26th yeah. Street, you know. And that's where they had these wild sessions, you know. And then, and again, those guys, I mean, you know, they were a little old enough, a little more inside, you know, a little less into yeah. the Cecil. Like, we were really into Cecil and Braxton and the Art Ensemble. We were, Don, we were really, Ornette, we were really looking to them, like, as guides. Mm -hmm. They were more looking to a bebop. I mean, if you talk to Randy Brecker, he just yeah. considers himself a bebopper. Randy yeah. considers himself a bebopper. 
even though like he changed music with the Brecker Brothers. If you ask him, he's like, I'm a bebop bro. You know? Yeah. And I think in a sense, Lieben probably considers himself a beboper too, you know? Probably, yeah. Yeah. You know. Definitely. Yeah, yeah interesting. I mean, I love bebop and I practice it, but I am not a bebopper. You know, I'm like, I'm like really from another world. Yeah, no, but it, it's good. You, you know that that's that you, you kind of created your own story. I mean, all of you guys, you know. Yes. Like, yeah. No, I definitely created my own my own reality of music, which is fantastic. You know, I think that's especially you know like the, the older generation. It all of them were so original. You know, like. Uh, whoever all of these musicians because they kind of learned from scratch in a way and many of the newer generations now basically are not so original i'll put it like that you know because they're just kind of recreating well you know you, your generation also still well, has it's, 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 it's a different world i think we caught the last of jazz being somewhat of a social and an underground Mm. and a hip scene yeah you know and then what happened was and then we created in the east village our version of that scene do you know what i'm saying in the east village yeah, we sure. had our version of a very hip very social very kind of kind of dangerous it's dangerous there you know you i can imagine like, yeah yeah and and then then what happened was people started going to school and it just is a different environment and i'm not i'm not making a statement of like um better or worse i'm no, just no, saying sure. it's different and you just have to rec you just have to recognize that and the world changes i mean you know i mean there aren't really neighborhood jazz clubs to go to like like we did and and, and you sit in with older guys who like i said everyone learned by by ear, by yeah. everyone learned just by someone showing you something. There wasn't a, a no one went to a school and um, kind of was taught, a, 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 you know, pedagogy or anything like that. You know, even sure. if you did go to school, no one had really developed because I caught the beginning of jazz education. But we were just taught by jazz musicians who just showed us, well, here's what I do learn this Miles Davis tune, transcribe this Miles solo practice a circle of fifths uh you know here's a cool mccoy here's a cool horse silver tune you should know mm. you know just like that like there was no school and yep. even what happened was well I, I i was actually going to school at nyu while i was on the east village scene like i i went back to school because i realized if i was going to school my parents would pay my rent and so when i first started on the east village scene i was just like i was working as a waiter sure. and uh and then I would show up as a waiter, like really tired. You know, I'd been out all night and, 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 and the people who ran the place were like, you know, you're gonna have to make a choice. And I said, well, I know what my choice is. I don't want to be a waiter. <laughs> so and NYU would start a jazz department, but the interesting thing was the trumpet teacher and, and Dave Douglas went there. So I met Dave at auditions. I met him in line at auditions for NYU jazz department. That's so cool. Just, yeah, yeah oh, that's wow. how long I've known Dave. Wow. And he, he had, was leaving, I guess he had gone to Berkeley. I think he had gone to Berkeley School of Music and he didn't like it. He wanted to come to New York. And I met him in line. And uh, my teacher, I wanted to practice trumpet because I already knew, like, I had this idea in my head there was something I wanted to do, which, you know, like, kind of like the Howard Johnson thing. Like, yeah. I want to be able to play any kind of music. So I need to be like a really good trumpeter. So I studied with this guy, Jimmy Maxwell. And Jimmy was old. Jimmy had played in Benny Goodman's band in the early 40s. Oh, wow, and, man. Yeah, yeah. So Jimmy knew like hmm. Ben Webster and Count Basie and, and, and Cootie. He sat next to Cootie Williams for two years. That's he the real there, thing, yeah. He was there the day Charlie Christian showed up to rehearsal for the first time. Oh, man. So he <laughs> was very interesting to study with because he had made his living. He had started as a jazz musician. And made his living at the beginning of what they call studios, which were different than it meant you actually worked. You were an employee of a studio. He worked for NBC. He worked for yeah. NBC Radio. And then when NBC started TV, he moved to NBC TV. And he had these incredible stories about like NBC Radio and the trumpet section would be, you know, 
him and Roy Eldridge and Charlie Shavers backing up Mildred Bailey, you know, and then he ended up, you know, doing the Tonight Show and all that stuff. And he was very interesting to study with because, you know, here I am, I want to play all this far out music. And I'm hearing it in my head. And he's just, no, you need to go bop, 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 bop. And I was like, I already know how to do that. But I didn't really know how to do oh, it. Yeah. I didn't know how to do it like the greatest trumpet player in the world. And that lesson, learning how to play really simple rhythms in a really, a, like, like lead the band. Because that's what a trumpet player does. A trumpet player leads the band from their, from their rhythm. Mm -hmm. We're like the king of instruments. So I learned like this old way of playing. And that's kind of what I've been able to use to kind of be able to play with anybody because I learned like this old, it's like learning the old alchemy from an, you know, an old wizard. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, it's like, well, this is really the secret to everything. And yeah, the world's all changed, but this is still the root of everything. Like if you know this root, then whatever you do, it's all coming from this really strong root. So yeah. I, I, that was, but meanwhile, I'm going out and, and you know playing with Jamil Moondock and Butch and Sahib and all this far out music, you know, and and all those guys. So I had kind of both going on at once. So it was pretty. Yeah, that's far amazing. Out, you know. Oh. Yeah. Yeah, that's amazing, man. Yeah, that you, you got you know you learned firsthand from the first generation, kind of basically. You know, I mean, if we yeah. don't count like yeah. Jelly Roll, Mar Morton, and those guys, but kind of you know the first. Right. Right. Wow, maybe yeah. he, he he learned music the way he learned music was from Louis Armstrong 78s and Duke Ellington 78s when they came out. And think about this. Back right. then, people could only afford people didn't have a lot of money in those days. You could afford 178 a month. That's six minutes of music. So you would spend a month listening to six minutes of music. It's like the opposite of the way people learn now. Oh, man, sure. Now it's Everyone just, information comes and goes. You would spend one month listening to six minutes of music. Yeah. And him and Gil Evans came up together. So him and Gil had a, a band when they were in their, in their early 20s. Man. And yeah, yeah. So he had these just incredible stories, man. And it, and it was just kind of like, he's the one who really, I, had, I was already loving Duke Ellington and, and Louis Armstrong. Just, I had naturally... Love that, but he kind of took that love and really nurtured it and kind of, um, yeah, he just nurtured it. He like, mm -hmm. yeah, this, he saw that I really like, I was actually interested in this music, and I don't think all of the students were actually that interested in that music. So I think he really, you know, he realized, oh, here's someone I can really help, you know, because he really, like, I didn't, he knew I didn't want to like copy that music, I just wanted to understand it, yeah. I wasn't sure. interested, like, oh, I don't want to play in a band that copies Louis Armstrong, but I want to understand Louis Armstrong, and I want to, like, learn learn what that music really is. You know, I wasn't saying, oh, you know, I, I want to be in a copy band. I was like, no, yeah, yeah, I'm out there. Punk, you know, you know, no, I'm playing punk rock and free jazz, man. But I want to learn about Duke Ellington and Louis Armstrong, you know, so. Yeah, and you, you keep bringing that up, like, especially now, you know, in the, the, this the community music albums. I, I hear that a lot now, actually. <laughs> Yeah. You, you know, it's there somewhere, and yeah, it's, it's beautiful. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, you you know, you, you mentioned you know playing punk and funk and and kind of free stuff and everything. Uh, where do you think in your eyes? I mean, you know, one of the first records I heard you on was the very big Carla big band, and yeah, like in your eyes, was that one of the most important, more important moments? Like in kind of in the beginning of your career let's say or like not even the beginning but like to make it even the well, next step further or well for me it was interesting because what it was was that i was in her daughter's band karen mantler's band mantler right? yeah yeah and so we opened for carla's band so we had, had a tour where karen mantler's band and eric mingus was in that band and um so we were just little cogs in the wheel in that band. Me and, and Pablo, the baritone player, everyone else in that band was either like the, the main soloists, like yeah, okay. who they brought from New York. And then everyone else was from London. 
Yeah, Andy yeah, and yeah, all those guys. Yeah, yeah, because they had started, but you know, all the all the other trumpet players, the trombone players, all like the auxiliary musicians. Yeah. And um, so we, you know, and I was a kid. I was really, you know, I wouldn't have been on that record if I hadn't been in, in her daughter's band. Oh, yeah. yeah. So I, for me, it was really just. I, I was just a guy playing fourth trumpet, but for me, what it was was a chance to be around people like Lou Soloff and Gary Valente. Gary Valente, yeah, sure. And, and obviously, Gary had a uh, huge influence on my playing. And in fact, Carla said to me, you know, and then playing with Victor Lewis and Don Elias. And Steve, I mean, yeah. And getting in, in Swallow and getting to know those guys. I mean, I wasn't that, you know, I was just a guy playing fourth trumpet, you know, I was like barely hanging on. I mean, I wasn't great. I really wasn't, man. Mm. I mean, I was just good. And I just had a lot of enthusiasm for music. But by being around Lou, I, I yeah. saw how great a trumpet could possibly be. So it kind of gave me, like, an idea of how high the bar was. You know, mm -hmm. if I was going to say, well, if you really want to do this, this is how good it's possible to be. And then around Gary, the whole thing was sound and yeah. slide that really influenced my slide playing. Just being near that sound and 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 feeling that in my body. And um, you know, I never like learned a Gary Valente solo or anything like that. I just had that feeling in my body after being on the road with him, and sure. so it became yet another part of what came out and. And uh, Hal Wilner had me and Carla on a, a Nina Rota um, concert in London. And I played some slide trumpet. Um, Michael Gibbs was like fascinated by the slide trumpet. So okay, I'm gonna write, <laughs> write, I want to write something for the slide trumpet. He's like, so, so he added like a slide trumpet, like solo, like a melody and a whole thing. And Carla said to me, she goes, she goes, Stephen. And I've known Carla since I was a little kid at, at Creative Music Studio. That's the other thing. Oh, really? I, I didn't know that. Well, wow. Yeah, I went to Creative Music Studio when I was like, I don't know, 15 years old or something Oh, wow. Like that. Okay. Uh, yeah, 15, 16 years old. And so I, Carla knew me since I was a little kid. And so she kind of didn't really take me seriously at first because, you know, she just knew me as like this little kid. <laughs> and uh, and then when I got older, it changed, you know, and, and we did this concert together and she said to me, uh, yeah, I, she goes, I had never heard a sound like that since Gary. So mm, it meant a lot wow. to me. Yeah, that because it wasn't like I was imitating Gary. It's just that part of that spirit was now part of my spirit, you know. Yeah, and so I was like, when I played, that was part of what came out, you know. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, Com make, makes complete sense. Yeah, you know, absolutely. I'll tell you who really influenced my side trauma playing, except not obviously Roswell, but was Joe Bowie. Oh, because really? I'm, like oh, yeah, so defunct and stuff like. Really? What happened was when I got to New York in '79, Defunk was just getting started. Yeah, with R Ronnie Barrage and all those cats. And yeah, I heard the original. They used to play at the Squat Theater on Friday nights. Though the first time I saw them, I don't even know if they were Defunk yet. They were still called St. Louis Ensemble, and they were playing at, at, at Bobo had a loft. Bobo Shaw had a loft called La Mama, but it wasn't La Mama Theater. It was a okay. different La Mama. It was really in the East Village, like. It was really dangerous to go there. It was like between B and C on like third. I'm telling you something. It was dangerous. <laughs> Someone said, man, you should go check out what these guys are doing. And Frank Lowe was hanging there. It was all these people. Oh, I wow. heard this. And Melvin. I don't... Maybe Ronnie was already in the band. It's hard to remember. It was a long time ago. Definitely Melvin was. I mean, I totally remember hearing Melvin. And then I then the Village Voice was right about Defunct. I saw it was the same guys. So I would go on Friday nights to hear Defunct of the Squat. And that, that show, because like, you know, I'd heard all this music when I was a kid, and but I was still separating it. Like, well, you had your Cecil Taylor, your art ensemble, yeah. and you had your, your funk and your Jimi Hendrix. But I didn't think about the fact that they could be one music. Yeah. And Defunct were the first people that said, no, you could take that rhythmic feeling from funk and Jimi Hendrix and take that free feeling from the art ensemble and, and Cecil and you could combine that and that 
And then Joe's, you know, Joe played, he played different back then. And there's not a lot of recordings of what Joe used to play like. Mm. He, you know, he, because he, he played so strong that you weren't actually, he, there was no way he could have kept playing like that. It was just too physical. Yeah, you know? too much. Yeah. There, there's a couple records, like very early records from the, from like, uh, there's an Oliver Lake record called Heavy Spirits. There's a Lester Bowie record called um, uh, maybe Fast Last or okay. Dope. Okay. Dope. There are mu- you know, and you can hear what Joe used to play like, and it, it he sounded like like Lester mixed with Jimi Hendrix, and yeah, and that really kind of influenced me. That really really influenced me. Like wow. Yeah. I, I want to try to do something like this. This is really cool, you know. Yeah. I loved Hendrix. I just awesome. didn't know how you could like translate Hendrix into jazz music, you know. Yeah. But he he would get these crazy sounds like Hendrix did. So you know, I, he was a huge. So you know, I gotta say, like you know, that defunct was a huge eye opener for me about what was possible, you know. And the records don't really show what it was like to hear them live it was ferocious man ferocious yeah yeah and you but basically you know it's 97 yeah when you moved to new york that they were kind of 79 79 sorry 79. sorry 79 yeah that's when they started it actually right so yeah, yeah. Oh, incredible yeah what, what what about the lounge reasons lizards like well, that you know funny thing is like they also played the squat theater i never went to go see them <laughs> I wasn't because I kind of knew, oh, yeah, it's this guy, John Lurie. Like, I okay. knew they were, you know, the thing about Joe was Joe came from, like, bag. He came more from, like, a serious music family. I don't know if you know this, but their father, you know, was a music teacher. Very oh, really? I didn't know that. Okay. Oh, yeah. 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 Their father was a very strict music teacher. And his sons were all crazy. But their father was a very strict guy. So they had this kind of, even though they were crazy, they came from this tradition of jazz. Yeah. And Lounge Lizards really came from the tradition of punk, of like, yeah. you know, you teach yourself to play something and you do it. So I wasn't that interested in that, you know? Hmm. Okay, interesting. It wasn't that I didn't like it. It's just that I just didn't feel like that was what I, you know. I mean, I like, you know, because I would still, you know, I was still going out to see, you know, whatever, go see Woody Shaw and go see Arm Blakey yeah. and go see, you know, I was still mainly a jazz guy. And then what happened was, you know, then the Lounge Lizards grew. Then there was the second version, you know, with Rebo and, yeah. and, and Roy and Curtis and, and uh, Eric Sanko. And that band, I that, then, then I started to hear that band. And it was like, and the band really changed. And it was yeah, like, they did, yeah. yeah. And I was like, oh, this is really some cool music, man. I mean, and of course, I knew that John had this reputation of being really crazy. Because Eric Senko, the bass player, was a good friend of mine. We used to play a lot. I knew John oh, really? was like, oh, yeah. We, and we, we, played, we played in different bands. We played in, we, I can't remember at first how maybe it was Foreign Legion. Um, there's a band called Foreign. But a lot of bands I played in for years that no one ever heard about because. Not you know, recorded or. Maybe we made like. We're on, so there was a compilation called This Is The Funk that had like all these like post-defunct bands on it, but no one ever heard of us really outside of our little yeah 20 block radius that we would play. They were great bands, you know. We just never got to the next level. And um, what happened was, you know, there was a big thing where the that those lounges just broke up. And then John, now now John's famous and has like real gigs and real tours and real money. And he started like going out at night to hear other musicians and he heard me play with Spanish Fly. Oh, okay. And uh, and he called me up and he said, um, you know, I'm putting in a new band. But first he goes like, oh, this is John Murray. I'm like, oh, hey, John, Steven. Nice to meet you. Uh, I'm putting together a new band, and uh, maybe I'm interested in playing. With you. He goes, but you're not going to get a lot of solos. I'm like, I'm like, no, no. The first thing he says is, "Do you have a suit? Do you have a suit?" I'm like, yeah, man, I got a suit. He goes, well, look, you're not going to get a lot of solos. I said, that that's cool, man. I I love your music. He said, well, send me a tape. 
So I, I had, we, we had um, recorded a demo with um, the Spanish fly. Spanish fly I had, yeah. And I sent it to him and maybe, maybe something from Kamikaze Ground Crew. You know, I didn't have a whole lot of stuff on, on record, but I bet I sent it to him. He called back, well, I really like your tone, but you know you're not going to get a lot of solos. I'm like, John, that's cool, man. So then, then I joined that band, and that was really – you asked me about the Carla things, but it was really the lounge list. Lounge list, yeah. Took me up to the next level of working because, you know, I was really a member of the band, and then I started helping John arrange things. Like, pretty early on, he – recognize that i kind of had this very natural gift to write mm. arrangements. i wasn't really trained by this just because i grew up with big band music you know because yeah. i i yeah. i was like one of the only guys in the band who came up in big bands and big bands is all written so it was very e it was very natural for me to translate john's kind of improvisationally kind of way of playing to say yeah well if you would write that as a big band chart here's here's what this would look like you know so i would help him like put, it's not like he couldn't write music he could sure, no, no, I don't know what you mean. Yeah, yeah. it's like i could do it really quickly because i had come from like he didn't come from big none of those guys played in big bands really but i grew up playing i mean i i was doing big band gigs in high school with grown-ups i i knew how to do that i could sit in a big band look at music play it pretty much perfect yeah. the first time I just, that's what I've been trained to do. So, and then that kind of led to, you know, not just being in the band, but, you know, working on his TV shows and then working on the movies and blah, blah, blah. So that was really kind of the next, and, and you're working like the best gigs in Europe and you're being the best promoters and, and, and watching and being in a band like that and watching John lead a band who's just such a brilliant band leader yeah. kind of showed me like, well, well, here's how you lead a band. I mean, it's it's not just that the music is really great, and it's not that just that John was known as an actor. It's like he was just so incredible on stage as a band leader that the audience didn't even have to like the music; they just loved the experience of being in the room with the music. You know what I'm yeah, saying? It's, yeah, it's like you now. You know, when I see videos of you, you know, with with the Millennial Band or you know with Sex Mob or whoever, it's like. It's kind of, kind of a continuation of that, what, what you're saying, very actually. Much is. And it's yeah. very interesting. There's a writer named Jim Mackney. And he, <laughs> yeah, sure. No, yeah. And, and he came to the Sex Mob gig last week, and he, uh, I called him up. He said to me, yeah, he, he, he brought his wife. And it was a pretty out gig. You know, it was definitely like, because some of the gigs we do are kind of more, because I don't really have a set list, so you never know, like, where it's going to go. And this one was pretty, like, all over the place. But, you know, and... um. He said to his wife, well, was it too out for you? She goes, no, I loved it. Like, I felt like at the end of the night, like, I really knew these guys. Mm, yeah, that's and, the biggest compliment. I, yeah. That's part of what I try to do. You know, it's part, and it was part of something me and Henry shared, which is, like, I'm not trying to play music for you. Like, I'm not trying to say, oh, here's all this great music I wrote. And here's all this cool things I can do on my instrument. I'm just trying to like give you an experience that you wouldn't otherwise have. Yeah. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah, but that's so important, man. Yeah. It's way more about like changing the vibrations in the room than I'm going to work out a great set and it's going to be this and it's going to be that, it's going to be that. Like that just doesn't interest me that. I mean, I'll do it if I have to and I'll do it for other people. Sure. But that's not what I'm interested in. I'm interested in like, can we change? Can I react to the audience? Energy, yeah. And read them and their, and right, and their energy and, and get some back and forth going. That's really what I'm interested in. Yeah. Well, that's so important, I think, you know, because it, when you listen to, you know, old, old recordings, like, you know, Parker, even people are like really in, in it, you know, and that, yeah. now so, some of that was lost through this intellectualization, let's call it, of jazz, which is like, I don't mind it, you know, I love hot meters and everything, but, I, and, you know, the complex structures and all that stuff, but it became a little bit hermetic in a way, you know, it's just like this, like, okay, it's almost like classical right. music. Well, I think jazz was always about this energy and this, you know, raw power in, in a much, sense, you know. I, I, well, I agree with you, obviously. And power has a lot to do with it. Mm. And that's kind of one, one thing that I do that 
And I learned that also from the lounge lizards. I mean, Rebo talked about that to me. I remember when he joined the band, when I joined the band, we were talking about it. He said, well, one thing you'll notice, he said, when you're in the band is the volume coming off the stage really affects the, the, the people. Like they, they can feel that energy. And he said, just check out, check this out. But because, you know, it's a different experience. Like John was really into like building these giant crescendos and, it's very effective and it's really has nothing to do with like, oh, it's something really slick we worked out and it's something amazing, incredible and nothing against music like that. Like, sure. I'll tell you something interesting. There's a guy, I'm not gonna say his name because I have so much respect for him and I really love his music. I've been listening to it for 40 years, but oftentimes we used to be on the same bills and his music was like the opposite of mine. Like, it, like my music gets loud and quiet and slow and fast and his music was always at one volume or like a lot of people playing just a few people playing it was always like the same amount of people playing always the same volume whatever song tempo the song was at the beginning it was the same way all the way through i used to go even though i the guy was like really genius i i love him and i love his music i'd say like, yeah man i don't know man this is kind of like and then i realized but guess what this is what he believes it. Yeah, sure. It's like I believe in what I'm believing. So you can't, I can't, it doesn't make any sense for me to like listen to this music and use my judgment because I'm not making the music. He is. And for him, this is what he believes in. And this is this is the message he wants to give the world. Sure. So everyone yeah. has a different message they want to give the world. And we all different people, we all have different beliefs. We all have different nervous systems. We all had yeah. different moms and dads. We all ate different food for lunch. And that's why there's room for all kinds of music. Yeah, yeah. I, mean, I, I completely agree. You know, some people like chocolate ice cream, some don't. So who's, everyone is right, you know. It's right. like, exactly. that's... Well, that's, that's a beauty, you know. Yeah. And that's why it's music and not like heart surgery. Like, if you do the yeah. heart surgery, and you're like, yeah, I don't feel like doing it. I'm going to do it like this. It's like, no, yeah, just put the fucking knife through the guy's heart. You killed him. It's like, <laughs> you know. That's it's one way good. only, yeah. Yeah, it's like heart surgery. You got to, like, do this. You got to, like, connect the little ventricle to the heart. You can't just do whatever you want in heart surgery. But oh, yeah, we don't do heart surgery. You play music, you know. Or, like, so, classical music. It's kind of the same, you know, a little yeah. bit variation. So, okay, interpreting it. But, you know, it's kind of the same, like, like heart surgery. Very, very you know yeah, and yeah yeah yeah, yeah. It, like it, you you know i i told you in the beginning i saw you guys with sex mob here in maribor like shit i don't that know that was a great show that was Man, an amazing show i, I still remember I, I have goosebumps now i don't know if, yeah you don't see like <laughs> when you said it, there was one of the best concerts i saw because you know that band you know i had you obviously on albums and you know all that stuff exotica and the earlier stuff and everything and seeing you guys live it was just you know i knew kenny of course and tony and all and brigham right. I, I saw brigham in so many other kind of seattle oriented contexts or whatever but just to see you guys this energy what what you said on stage was incredible and but i wanted to ask you know leading a band like this or co-leading leading i guess no i'm leading i'm not co-leading and i'm you're leading, leading it okay leading. <laughs> you're leading it but like you know but it's it's also musically it's a collective. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Musically it's a collective. That's you know. Anyway, I don't mean to interrupt. No, I, I wanted to ask you like in the beginning when you guys first started coming to Europe. You know how do you see now like after what twenty five years I guess the development the development yeah. of the band right. and how did the audiences react in the beginning in Europe? I mean. Well, I think people always liked it because it was so, they knew me from the Lounge Lizards. It was, we were playing, we had, we were young, we played with a lot, like we don't play like that anymore. I, we, I can't, I mean, I can't play like that anymore. I was, you know, I'm 60 years old. I was, you know, I was, I was 35. There's a big difference between those two ages. We used to just get out there and go like, ah! you know, the whole, yeah. it was like an hour of just like, ah! Exactly. And people, and people just loved it because it had very punk, yeah. very rock, but it sounded like 
a jazz band because it was a, you know, when I started, I was thinking about the New York Art Quartet. You know those records with with Roswell, John Chikai. Uh, it was actually only one famous record on, on ESP. It's Roswell, okay. John Chikai, Milford Graves, mm. and um, I can't remember the name of the, the original bass player. He he kind of disappeared, okay. and okay. and the music was very abstract, but it was the way that the alto saxophone and the slide and then having an acoustic bass and drums yeah i just put that idea but i did something completely different with it so but what i'm trying to say is so the sound of the band was not that different than avant-garde band from the 60s you know like so yeah. people who liked avant-garde music said well it's not like you're giving them something brand new and they, it's not like i'm up there with a sampler and uh you know a tap dancer i'm yeah. up there with like you know so they had something to, but it was completely unlike anything anyone had ever heard. And I wasn't doing a funk band. I wasn't up there with like electric guitar playing funk. It was a jazz band, yeah. but kind of just playing this music no one had really, because you know, something I'm playing, you know, playing, you know, Goldfinger and we're yeah, playing yeah. Like ABBA and we're playing James, you know, we're playing uh, just whatever. And people were just like, what the, what is this? You know, because no one, you know, we, I, I think I can I mean, I don't want to take credit for it, but I think I have to say that I think I was one of those people who helped, if you can call it help, I brought in popular music to improvise music. Yeah, you were definitely one of the first, like, that, then this boom started, like, this huge, right. whatever, Everyone. you know. Yeah. yeah. I mean, because the Spanish Fly, you know, we would play Hendrix. Yeah. We would play Duke Ellington. We would play Nirvana, and you know, and nobody was really doing that. They were just playing. They were playing original music or playing improvised music. Yeah. And you know, and I also got some flack for that from from people. You know, people were like, you know, what you can't write your own music. I was like, no, I can write my own music. I just like playing songs people know. I mean, I say I would tell people like, and people say, call Sex Mob a cover band. I'm like, um. Is Lester Young a cover band? Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. I saw songs? some of that. How many, yeah. How many songs did Lester Russian. Young write? I mean, how many songs did Roy? I mean, how many songs did, did Count? You know, it's like uh, Louis Armstrong. Is that a cover band? How many songs yeah. did Louis Armstrong play popular music? You know, um, only you know Charlie Parker played popular songs with his own melodies on them. Yeah, I mean, standards are basically popular music. You know, like so, not everyone who plays no, standards, they are, they are. are Art, popular yeah. music that's why they're called standards exactly yeah that's why they're called standards so if someone comes up and plays standards they don't say oh it's a cover band <laughs> exactly so, yeah i would just get i would just get pissed at people i'm like man you don't even know what you're talking about like i'm playing standards like i'm yeah. not playing a cover band i'm like this has nothing to do with the way the songs were originally done i'm just using popular music to improvise yeah 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 exactly. What everyone's done in jazz since the beginning. That's yeah. actually the jazz tradition. The jazz tradition is not to keep playing the same songs for a hundred years. Yeah. I mean, that's part of it now, but it wasn't originally, you know. That's why Lester Young played different songs than Louis Armstrong. Yeah. You know, that's why Coltrane played Inchworm and My Favorite Things. Yeah. Yeah. No, but it's like, uh, you know, why, why should there be a difference between, I don't know, my favorite things, uh, Fly Me to the Moon and uh, Little Wink or Purple Haze. In the end, you know, it's, it's all music. Right. So who decides what's a standard and what it's I'll not you, or, you know, whatever. So right. it's, I'll tell you an interesting story. One time I was listening to Miles Davis' uh, Surrey with a fringe on top. Now, I don't listen, I don't know much about Broadway musicals. I've been listening to Miles, you know, that's Miles and Coltrane and Red Garland and Philly Joe Jones. Yeah. Paul Chambers. And I've been listening to that, like, that was like the first Miles record I got, was that one. It was like one called a Two for Record. And I used to listen to it all the time. And one time it comes on the radio, I'm listening to it. My wife goes, Man, why are you listening to that corny music? <laughs> what are you talking about corny music? I'm like, this is Miles, John Coltrane, Philly Joe Jones, Paul Chambers. She goes, this is Oklahoma. You know, it was because it was, she knew the song. She was just listening to the melody of the song. She's saying, that's the melody of the song from Oklahoma. This is some like corny Broadway music. Yeah. So. Well, my favorite I, things, you know. 
yeah so yeah so it's just all kind of how you look at it so yeah exactly yeah funny funny like i, I saw you guys are touring with sex pop in europe in, in the yeah. fall right yeah. yeah man i hope to catch you guys like are you in austria somewhere or uh, have to check your I schedule i haven't seen the whole schedule yet I, unfortunately it's only two weeks because uh it's so ironic because it's usually tony and kenny that have all this work but brigging has a um teaching at a new university and the university is only going to give them two weeks off from work oh shit okay so we can only be for two weeks. So, I mean, they wanted to do a three week. We haven't been in Europe for like three, three or four years. Yeah, I know. Yeah, yeah. that's why. I mean, I'll yeah, check the so, dates. Yeah. yeah so I'm excited. Yeah. Yeah. And we have a new record and we have, and we have a new sex mob record that I haven't even talked about because. When is I, it coming? I don't even quite know. Um, okay. Because it's on the coolest label. So cool. They don't have release dates. They're so cool. And they don't care that no one knows about them. It's the most awesome record label. It's called Corbett versus Dempsey. You, have you heard of them? Never. <laughs> sorry. See? I mean, okay. don't be sorry. I talk to like the guys who are like the craziest music heads in the world and they've never heard of it. Okay, when you get off this call, you Google I, I will. Corbett, yeah. Corbett versus Dempsey and you're going to freak write out. It, man, write it down. Because Wait. what it is, it's like they have an art gallery and they also put nice. out books and CDs and records. Wow. And they have like if you look what they've released, it's like the way I met them is through Hal Wilner. They they re-released Hal's first two records. They mm. made very rare, re obscure re-releases. So Hal's first record was the Nina Rota record. He also did a Beaver Harris record before that. Really? Oh, wow. yeah. Yeah. So they did that, but they have you know Don Cherry records, really? Lester Bowie, Philip Wilson duet record, Joe McPhee record. Wow, but man. They, they, yeah, then, but they have Sun Ra and and they've put out all Sun Ra's poetry books. They've done like a, a, but they even have like Van Dyke Parks. I mean, they have some of the guys from Sonic Youth. I mean, it's just like this oh, incredible. Okay. So when I saw it, I was like, well, this is my home. Yeah, so exactly. I like this is me. So I I got in touch with him. I said, hey man, you know, I got this new Sex Mob project, and it's with Scotty Hard, who's the guy who produced our first few records. And it's really in wild process in that like Scott sent me uh, nine electronic pieces. Some being like a full on, you know, seven minute through composed electronic piece. Awesome. Some just being maybe like a four minute, uh, four bar loop. Maybe one would just be like a one bar loop, you know, all different, each one. And what I did was I wrote music to go on top of them. Oh, wow, man. Okay. On, on top of these loops. Then he took that stuff and worked for like a year and a half, manipulating it, cutting it up, recutting it, you know, pulling the loops out, putting loops back in. And it's, man, it's like nothing I've ever done. Ooh. It's really deep. So they heard it. The next day I get an email like, we'll put this out in a second. <laughs> oh, sure. So it's totally cool because it's like nothing like nothing I've ever done. It's with a really cool, like, it's something that's, you know, very much associated with art music and, and the art world, not like the jam band world or the free world, which at, at my age, I kind of feel like, yeah, I'd rather be, I'd like to be seen in the world of Hal and Lester and Don Cherry and Sunra. I mean, I kind of feel like that's my world. Sure. Yeah. So I'm like really pleased, you know, that, that, that it's so cool, man. Stage. So cool. Yeah. Looking forward. Will you incorporate these loops and stuff also oh, yeah, into live been, gigs? Yeah, we've just started learning how to play some of that music. Yeah. yeah we, okay. played, we played like two of the songs for the first time at the last gig. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. What about I mean, loops? We're not going to use live loops. Oh, yeah. That's what I mean. Yeah. yeah. Okay. 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 Cool. Wow, man. So much looking forward to hear that. Cool. Yeah. Woo. I hope to catch you. I, I'll definitely check your schedules and if yeah, you're it would be nice to meet you and have a beer yeah definitely man it would be nice if you're in vienna I'll, I'll try to catch you in vienna it's like two hours from Maribor, so that's doable uh, right well i mean i hope we're in vienna i mean i haven't played porgy and you know i used to play porgy like two or three times a year sure you know the other thing is like you know i, I used to be like the young musician that they always want to bring and i'm you know i toured europe for 30 years so i'm not like <laughs> There's other young people now, and that's it's their time to, you know, yeah. just the way it is, you know. So, but you were in Porgy with Ray Anderson in March, right? Yeah, but that was, 
No, oh. I couldn't make that tour. Oh, you didn't make no J James Allard then did it, right? Or yeah, yeah, okay. Oh yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, okay. I was you know, I was not ready to do a European tour with COVID going on. I just oh, shit. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And they and the irony is then I got asked to do a tour with little feet, which was like all the COVID protections, like you know. You're in a bus. No one's allowed backstage. No one's allowed around your food. Da, da, da. I didn't get COVID, but five people in the band got COVID. <laughs> Ray and those guys, they're going out to restaurants. They're playing little clubs. Blah, blah, blah. Everyone's hugging each other. No one got COVID. It's that yeah. irony. Bizarre. Bizarre world, man. Cool.